Hey Optimancers, Chris here. I've been doing a series where I rank subclasses, and a few weeks ago I did the monk subclasses, and I mean unsurprisingly they didn't fare very well. Now I think it's important to say before I go any further that these ratings were assuming a game that includes feats. I do think the monk fares better if the game isn't using feats. Also, I should say that if you think the monk's fine and you're having fun playing monks, as is, then great. I don't want anyone to think I'm telling them their experience is wrong or they have to agree with me about the monk. These evaluations are based on my personal assessment and my personal experience, and those might be different than yours. I'm not an authority, I'm just a player who likes to share my opinions online. But if you are a player or a DM, or both, who agrees with me that the monk as written doesn't work very well, and maybe you have some interest in how the monk might be altered to function more effectively, then this video is for us. If you like this content and would be interested in supporting it, you can check out the link to my Patreon in the video description. Patrons of this channel can see these videos early and without the YouTube ads, and my top level patrons join me and play some D&D every month. Today, I want to recognize these top-level patrons. Kurt G, Lee LeMay, IGW, Loxodon13, Martz, Math Guy Dave, Matt, Mouse the Tank, Mikkel Precursor, Nathaniel McCauley, and Nick Lutz. Thank you all so much for your support. Let's get started. So I've tried monk fixes before, and frankly, I've never been happy with the results. There's a few reasons for that, and I'll go over that. But first, let's narrow down the areas of the monk that I think need fixed. First, I find that monks have weaker defense than other marshals. And in addition, I find the defensive options they do have are very restricting, and they're not even necessarily thematic. Second, I find that having everything work off the same resource, like key, means that you have a bunch of abilities and the same ones tend to get used over and over and then other features never get a chance to get used because you don't have any key left to use them with. Third, I find, I, I'm just going to call out specifically the stillness of mind feature is worded in such a way that it doesn't work the way you think it will. Fourth, they have some features that really don't do anything in gameplay. Now, the monk's not alone in this. There's other classes too that get features that you know, I guess we would call them ribbon features that are really just window dressing. But you know what? If you're playing a caster and then you get one of these features, well, you know what? You're still getting new spell options when you level up. But when you're a non-caster, like a monk, if you get a feature that's just window dressing, that's disappointing because you essentially get nothing. Fifth, speaking of disappointing, let's talk about the capstone. I mean... I usually don't get anywhere near 20th level, so maybe it shouldn't matter if a capstone is a letdown. But you know what? Even if I never get that far, a good capstone still at least makes it feel like you're striving for this cool ultimate feature, and I kind of think that adds some excitement. Sixth, 11th level is tough for monks. One scaling of a martial arts die, and that's it. And to a lesser extent, but still a thing, level 17, we see monks do poorly against other marshals again. So, you know, we often see monks at low levels and they seem to be operating fine. But it's when we get into those double digit levels, things go wrong. And once we get into that, you know, high levels, very wrong. And finally, seventh, they have this martial arts die. That's kind of this defining feature of the class. And the feature includes that they can use this die instead of the normal damage die of a weapon they're using. Except the martial arts die is almost never better than the weapon's damage die. So it's, what's the point? I mean, even at high levels, we're never getting above a d10 and your weapon might even be doing a d10 damage normally. But then things get weird because when that die does catch up, suddenly things like using your quarterstaff in two hands becomes pointless. There's literally no advantage to the versatile property. Thematically, I think using quarterstaffs, spears, or swords, both one and two-handed make sense for monks, 
thematically. But there should be some kind of reward for using two hands, even if it's a small advantage. So that's the list of things I think need fixed. Can they all be fixed? Now, there's a lot of different ways we can fix these things, but the thing is, we got to make sure that the cure isn't worse than the disease. Once we get into homebrew, I've seen this a lot. Sometimes you don't really consider the impact these changes will have on your game, especially if they're hard to remember or overly complex or involve tracking a whole bunch of new things. Now, one solution I have seen uh, mentioned as a possibility is that maybe Monk should get more key. In fact, I've even heard maybe Monk should get an infinite amount of key or none of their features should cost key, essentially. And I think that neither of these solutions work. Uh, now, if it's just talking more key, well, then we still have the problem that some of the features of the monk are better than others, but they cost the same amount of key. So am I ever going to be using Step of the Wind when I could be using Stunning Strike? Probably not. So why would I give up uses of Stunning Strike to do Step of the Wind? And it doesn't matter whether I've got five key available or eight key available. I'm still going to be spending that key on the better feature. Now, when it comes to infinite key, then I think we get it completely backwards because a monk actually doesn't struggle that much at low levels. It's as we get into higher levels, level five, things start to go wrong. Level 11, they really go wrong. And then level 17, they're just awful compared to other classes. So it's the higher level we go, the bigger the challenge is with the monk. But if we're giving infinite key, we're actually benefiting the low levels, not the high levels. So we're applying this solution to the wrong part of our progression. Never mind, I think it's overtuning, but even if it wasn't, it just fixes the wrong part. It is totally misdirected. So here's the pitfalls I've identified that I'm going to be conscious of with these suggestions. Number one, although having everything work off key has problems, it is easy for a player to keep track of. Having a whole bunch of different resources to track is going to create a bookkeeping hassle for players, and we need to keep ease of play in mind. Number two, I don't want to completely redesign the monk. Ideally, I want something that isn't going to constantly need players visiting the house rules to figure out how their character works. I want simple fixes. In the end, I want the monk's features to look not too much different than they do now. The idea isn't to make a new class, but instead make this class work better. And finally, number three, I don't want to overtune this. The idea isn't to make monks the most powerful class in the game or even above average. It, they don't need to be above average. I just want to bring them up into the realm where the other classes are, even if it's the lower end. So if I make a mistake here, I would rather that mistake be I was too cautious rather than too liberal with these changes. I mean, imagine for a moment that we take these fixes and then we apply them to a game. Now we've got this campaign going and suddenly a player is playing a monk. If we find that this didn't quite do enough, no player is going to mind you saying, you know what, maybe you should do another point of damage with your hits, or maybe you should have a little bit extra of this resource or that resource. But if you have it so that this monk player is overshadowing other players, that's a bigger problem because no player wants to hear, okay, you've got too much. I'm taking stuff away from you. One final thing before we get started on the changes, the monk base class has some issues that I'm going to suggest some fixes for, but that's not a complete fix because there are issues with monk subclasses too. The mercy subclass has some amazing features. The sun soul monk doesn't. So if we make a decent monk base class, this doesn't change the fact that we probably need to visit some of the subclasses that don't work well. So I will be addressing that too, but not in this video. I'll be posting another video where I discuss monk subclass fixes, but for now, let's get the base class working decently. So first I'll go through the changes I'm recommending, and then let's see how they address the goals I identified. Let's start at level one with martial arts. Here I am recommending two changes. The first is the martial arts die. So the martial arts die normally starts at a D4, becomes a D6 at level 5, D8 at level 11, and a D10 at level 17. 
with the changes I'm recommending, I'm recommending we start at a D6, then it will become a D8 at level 5, and then, and this isn't going to sound all that intuitive, but 2D6 at level 11 and 3D6 at level 17. And we're going to add one sentence to the end of this point right here, and that sentence is going to read, when using the martial arts die for a weapon with a versatile property used in two hands, add plus one to the damage total. Okay, so why switch the martial arts die this way? Well, this keeps the martial arts die scaling at the same points. So it's not hard to remember when your martial arts die is going to scale. Now, it has a big scale at level 11, and a D10 would have sound more obvious, like if we'd gone D6, D8, D10. But I punched up the math, and the monk still falls behind with a one die type higher once you get to 11. But if you go to 2d6, then it holds up. And I mean just. It just holds up. Same thing at 17. Going from 2d6 to 2d8 might have sounded like more obvious, but it doesn't quite hold up. I did the math. But 3d6 just gets there. So we go d6, d8, 2d6, 3d6. And why plus one damage on the versatile property? Well, the plus one damage total means that even when you're using your martial arts die with a versatile weapon, you get some kind of bonus for using it with two hands. But why not just increase the die type by one? Well, that would work until we get to level 11. And then, what, I guess we could do a D8 and a D6, or maybe we do 2D8, but then it's a little overtuned. A plus one provides the same bonus as increasing a die type by one on average, and it works at all levels, and it's not complicated. It's easy to use. So that's one change, martial arts die. The other change is this. Martial arts says you gain the following benefits while you are unarmed or wielding only monk weapons and you aren't wearing armor or wielding a shield. We're gonna add one word to this sentence. Instead, it's gonna read, you gain the following benefits while you are unarmed or wielding only monk weapons and you aren't wearing heavy armor or wielding a shield. So why do we want to do that? Well, because of course you can do martial arts in armor. We know this. This isn't a matter of opinion. Martial arts get done in armor all the time. And they get done in armor in fiction all the time too. Not always, but sometimes. So taking away that option just doesn't make sense. Now, I don't necessarily see a lot of, you know, kung fu happening in plate and shield. So the restriction on shields does kind of make sense. Restrictions on heavy armor do kind of make sense. And I'm not adding armor proficiency to the monk. So if you want proficiency, then that's something else. You're going to have to look at multiclassing or racial options or feats. But this way, now you're playing a mountain dwarf, you have your medium armor proficiency, you can put on scale mail, and you'll end up with the same 16 armor class that you are likely going to end up with the unarmored defense. But like with the Barbarian now, you don't have to go the unarmored defense route. It's one option, or you could do the armor option. The other thing I'm changing at level 1, I think is pretty obvious. The hit die, of course, it should be a D10. Paladins, fighters, rangers, they all get D10 hit points. Is the monk supposed to be more fragile? Is the idea that martial artists are somehow easily breakable? That doesn't really fit the fantasy, I don't think. Makes sense to me that they would be the same as the other marshals. D10, obvious switch. Okay, so let's go to level two and look at key. So the first change right here. Key save DC equals eight plus your proficiency bonus plus your wisdom modifier. We're gonna change it to dexterity modifier. So why do we wanna do this? Well, because now we're gonna see all kinds of different builds. The aforementioned Mountain Dwarf wearing scale mail might be punching with their strength score. The traditional unarmored monk that is dexterity and wisdom can absolutely happen as well. Or other combinations. It just gives the player more freedom. And honestly, it is not broken in any way. A DC that uses your attack ability score is exactly what we've already seen with Battlemaster Fighters. So this has already been play tested for years and we know it works. And it allows us to focus on our dexterity, and we don't get punished for doing that. 
Now let's look at our starting three key features. So first, flurry of blows, I don't recommend changing. Patient defense, I don't recommend changing. Step of the wind, will no longer cost key. Step of the wind is probably the weakest of our level two options, so it just doesn't see much play considering it costs the same amount. Now keep in mind you're still using your bonus action, so you're giving up a bonus action attack to do this, and I think that's fair. It's also perfectly in line with what other classes and races can do. The monk needing key for this was always an outlier. But once we take away the key cost, then also there's no resource to keep track of, so it's easy to use. If anything, we made bookkeeping easier for monks this way. Then we're going to jump to level 4. Quickened Healing is one of the optional class features from Tasha's, and it allows you as an action to spend two key points and you roll your martial arts die. You regain a number of hit points equal to the number rolled, plus your proficiency bonus. Now we did scale our martial arts die a little bit, but you know what, even then, think about it this way, at fourth level when you use this, you'd be rolling a d6 plus two. That's about five or six points of healing. And this is demanding that you spend half your key to get that five or six points of healing once. I honestly don't understand why they made this feature cost two key points. The healing isn't much, even with our boosted martial arts dice. This does comparable healing to what the Mercy Monk does, except it's self only and it costs twice as much. So I'm recommending we make it one key point. Now it is the same cost as the Mercy Monk ability. It's still not as flexible, so the Mercy Monk ability does not become obsolete, but it actually becomes a reasonable expenditure of key now. Then we get to fifth level and we get Stunning Strike. This is the one feature I think it needs its own resource pool. I was originally thinking once per proficiency bonus per long rest, that's kind of the standard now for individual resources for features. But then I thought about the number of players that I talked to that love spending all their key on this feature. And they might actually find once per proficiency bonus per long rest overly limiting. So how do we prevent these players from having their favorite trick limited on them? I think pretty simple. Once your uses are gone, now it costs one key to use the feature again. So Stunning Strike stays the same, except it has its own resource pool. So you have proficiency number of uses per long rest. Once those uses are gone, you can use a key point to do Stunning Strike again. Then we get up to 7th level, and what Stillness of Mind does is, starting at 7th level, you can use your action to end one effect on yourself that's causing you to be charmed or frightened. Now, I've mentioned before, the problem with this ability, I mean... Obviously, it hurts to give up your action in order to get rid of an effect, but still, it's still okay, except for there are sometimes there are charmed conditions or frightened conditions that tell you what you have to do with your action, so you can't choose to use stillness of mind. So what we have is cases where a monk can have this feature and still be unable to end charmed or frightened on themselves, and that's I don't think the intention, I don't think designers really considered the possibility that the monk wouldn't be able to spend the action to get rid of Charmed or Frightened. And I think we can just reword this so that it works the way that the designers intended. So instead, what we'll say is stillness of mind. If you start your turn under the Charmed or Frightened condition, you can choose to end one of those conditions. If you do so, you may not take an action on your turn. Does that sound the same to you? Well, it is almost the same. For the most part, this doesn't really change the feature. You're still giving up your action, you're still removing the condition. What I've done is close the loophole that can sometimes prevent you from using this feature. Some charmed and frightened effects dictate how you spend your action, as I mentioned. But with this wording, that doesn't matter, because you remove the condition before your action ever comes up. And that means it's going to work the way I kind of figure it was always intended to. Now we are going to jump up a ton of levels, all the way up to level 15. Timeless Body just doesn't do much, and it's all you get at 15th level. But if you really had this eternal youth, don't you think there might be a mechanical benefit from that? I'm no longer in my youth, but I remember it, and the alteration actually seemed pretty obvious to me. We add one sentence to the end of the feature. 
Timeless body at 15th level, your key sustains you so that you suffer none of the frailty of old age and you can't be aged magically. You can die of old age, however. In addition, you no longer need food or water. You also recover a level of exhaustion when you take a short rest. Yep, I stole this from the Ranger. This feature is a level 15 feature and in most cases, I wouldn't expect it to provide any mechanical benefit at all. And this is all we get at level 15. The exhaustion recovery fits with the theme of the ability, and although it's still not likely to come up often, it at least feels like we've actually gotten a mechanical advantage. Then, level 18, Empty Body. Beginning at 18th level, you can use your action to spend 4 key points to become invisible for 1 minute. During that time, you also have resistance to all damage but force damage. Just going to change this to, beginning at 18th level, you can use your bonus action to, done. That's it. I think this is pretty obvious. Losing a round of combat, except, I mean, I guess you could make one attack using your bonus action, feels rotten. Finally, our capstone. Perfect self. Gonna change this one entirely. At 20th level, your mystical powers manifest to their ultimate form. Your dexterity and constitution scores increase by 4. Your maximum for those scores is now 24. So, you're a 20th level character. You need something good for that. I've taken this right from the Barbarian, but I switched the scores so that they would be fitting for the Monk. I thought about Dexterity and Wisdom, but that is a plus 4 armor class bonus. The Barbarian only gets a plus 2 armor class bonus with their Capstone, so Dexterity and Constitution make the most sense and are balanced against what the Barbarian gets. So, just a quick recap of the changes I'm recommending. Number 1. Hit Die changes to D10. Number 2. Martial arts can be done in light or medium armor. Now, keep in mind that there are still benefits to being unarmored. You still get unarmored defense. You still get unarmored movement. But if you do wear light or medium armor, you can do your martial arts. Number three, the martial arts die now. It starts at a D6 at level 1, becomes a D8 at level 5, 2D6 at level 11, and 3D6 at level 17. Number four. The DC for our key powers are now dexterity based. Number 5. Step of the Wind no longer costs key. Number 6. Quickened Healing now costs one key. Number 7. Stunning Strike now has its own resource pool. And if you run out of uses, you can spend a key to continue using Stunning Strike. Number 8. Stillness of Mind now works. Number 9. Timeless Body now includes an exhaustion recovery on a short rest. Number 10. Empty Body uses a bonus action to start. And number 11. Our Capstone is now Perfect Self, plus 4 Dexterity, and plus 4 Constitution. So, how much of this do you need to look up during gameplay? Maybe the reduced cost of Quick and Healing, that might be something you might forget. Honestly, most of this stuff is only going to come up at the level ups, and it's not going to be stuff you need to look up in the middle of a game. There is one extra resource pool to keep track of at level 5, so you have two total resource pools. I still think that's really easy. So how did these changes address my issues with the monk? So let's take a look. First was my issue with monk defense being weaker and more restricting. Well, that restriction is removed. Now, you will give up your unarmored movement bonuses if you wear armor, so you still might not want to, but at least you have the option. The D10 hit points increases durability, and a bonus action disengage does give you the option to play a more defensive style. Second, I found that some features never saw use because of the key cost. Well, now that Stunning Strike has its own pool, players are incentivized to spend key elsewhere. You'll see monks using Step of the Wind now, because it doesn't cost key. Quickened Healing doesn't have crippling costs, so we might see that. And then third, Stillness of Mind is now fixed. It still uses your action, but you can end Charmed or Frightened now without exception. Fourth, every feature the monk has now at least has some kind of mechanical advantage. And fifth, our capstone is now terrific something definitely to look forward to. And sixth, our martial arts die now should eventually do more damage than our weapons. So we can actually use it for monk weapons, and it's good. And it no longer disincentivizes using weapons in two hands. So how about our DPR? How does that look? I wanted to make sure 
I did enough, but I didn't overcompensate. So I did a lot of math here. So what I did is let's give the monk a quarter staff and then have them use it two handed. Start the character with a 16 dexterity and then raise our dexterity at levels four and eight. And then once we get key, we expand it on flurry of blows. This is where it puts us. As you can see, the monk is above baseline all the way up. By the way, if you're wondering about what baseline means or how I calculate damage, I've linked a video in the video description. And if you're interested in how I calculated the math for this particular chart, I've included that math in the video description as well. But based on these rules, if the monk spends their key on flurry of blows, they're able to achieve and slightly get over baseline all the way up. I will say that if you're not spending your key on flurry of blows, the monk still falls below baseline. So this isn't a lot of damage. But you know what? This is also the base monk. We haven't added a subclass yet. This is fairly appropriate here for a marshal that can also deliver status conditions because remember, we can still do stunning strike and we can still spend all our key on something else. So we're not giving up stunning strike in order to achieve these numbers. And generally speaking, when I've got a character that is supposed to be filling multiple things, like doing a bit of control and damage, this isn't far off where I would expect it to be. The only time the monk really gets significantly above the baseline is level 20, and that's because we gave them a good capstone. So those are my proposed changes for the monk. I'm listing them in the video description, and I'll pin a comment with them as well. And like I said, a video where I talk about monk subclasses and the fixes for some of them is upcoming. So hope you'll join me for that. Otherwise, until next time, I'm going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you soon.